Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Take Back My Brain. I'm your host, Lori Hammer. And today I'm really excited about this episode because as all of you know, I work with the brain and a lot of people come to me on SSRIs or other psychotropic medications or like, how do I get off of this medication? And you all know that I use amino acid therapy. I'm happy to work with your doctor and stuff, but sometimes you have to do another way. And because it can be very difficult in coming off of all these types of different medications. And I have an expert with me today, um, Dr. Joseph Witt Doring, and he runs a clinic that is very specific to tapering people off of their mood medications or psychotropic medications. And so we're going to dive into that today, all the ins, the outs, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it all. And so thank you, Dr. Joseph, for being here today. Thanks, Laurie. Glad to be here. Ah, uh, great. Well, where is your clinic? So we, we work in about nine different states at the moment. I'm trying, physically, I live in Park City, Utah, but we do the big ones, California, New York, Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Colorado, Georgia, New Mexico. I may have missed some, but if you want to know where we work exactly, you can go to taperclinic.com and we have a big US map right on the homepage with all of the states we're licensed in. Awesome. And so you can work virtually with people from those states? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I love I love that. So um, how did you get into this? Because it's not your typical, hey, I just want to open up a tapering clinic for people on medication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, trigger warning. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you've sort of introduced it, but you're going to hear a lot of hot takes on psychiatry that you probably have not heard from your doctor in this yeah. explanation. And so- I think very early on from going into psychiatric training, I just realized that it just, a lot of things just didn't make sense. Like right down to like several things, for instance, like the diagnoses, they're, they're not valid medical diagnoses in the sense that other ones are, you know, whereas, you know, if you if, if you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, you know, it, there's an underlying biological problem there. The symptoms that we use in the clinical diagnosis make sense. And they, and they sort of stem from the underlying pathology. Right. But with something just like depression, for instance, all of the symptoms, they're, they're quite arbitrary. They were just voted on by people. There's no underlying <clears throat> uh, biological problem. A lot of them have been proposed like a chemical imbalance or or different problems, but they never really map out. And, and that's why in psychiatry, we don't use any laboratory tests because there's, there's nothing that ties the diagnoses together. And so... I didn't like that. I didn't like that the diagnoses yeah. well um, weren't weren't valid in that way. But I'm okay with that. I mean, let, let's say we just don't know what the underlying cause is. We could just use them, and it's useful. It's a good way of understanding of of maybe just labeling people who need help. But the other problem I had was that the way we oft, often talked about them was as if there was some well understood biological problem. Right. You know, like whether these these were serious medical conditions and um you know it was like di you know depression is like diabetes and and you need to go to your doctor to get help and so that that felt off to me and then on top of that um we had a tendency to say the drugs were a lot safer than they were mm. we i constantly hear people saying you know antidepressants they're safe and effective and but they would leave out all of these caveats like yeah, right. for the two months that we studied them for, they were safe and effective. Median duration of antidepressant use is two years now. And right. we've got something like, I don't know, like 15% of the population taking them. And um, and so there were so many ways that I was being taught about what mental illness was and how the drugs worked and how, how useful they were that didn't sit right with me. And then the more I looked, the more I realized that... Um, um, that, that I actually think most, most psych, a lot of psychiatrists and I think a lot of doctors are practicing with a model that harms people. And so I wanted to help people come off. That's, it's a lot right. to unpack, so, but that's, so we're poke that's where I landed. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to poke yeah. the bear. So we might get some good comments. Yeah. On this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm. No. And I understand what you're saying. Cause I was, I was in nursing school and I went to nursing school because I, I wanted to get into psychiatric nursing. And, um, cause it fascinated me and we just had some things in our family. I'm like, that's kind of the route that I want to go. And I got into, you know, like, you know, my psychiatric nursing clinical and I'm like, 
I am just going to be a pill pusher. And there really is no solution here for these, for these patients other than, you know, we're just gonna put them on this med. We're going to tell them, well, I don't know how long you have to be on it, maybe for life. And then nothing's really there, there to help them. And it just seemed very arbitrary and not good medical practice to me. So I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I went the nutrition route. Um, you went a little bit different route, but, um, I, I get where you're yeah. coming from. So kind of poking the bear. <laughs> well, I mean, the gosh, and, and you know, more, the more I've like marinated in being a psychiatrist in the 21st century, the more I've realized that there are a lot of influences out there that push us to look at mental illness in a certain way and treat it in a certain way. For instance, you know, going going back to depression, which is the the big one, the one that mo most um, that, that most people are diagnosed with out of the psychiatric conditions. Um, it's multifactorial, you know, so it's like, you know, you could have traumatic experiences yeah. or you could have, you know, some personality, um, some personality things that, that, that just make you struggle at work or in your relationships. And sure, maybe there is an underlying biological component that people haven't identified yet, you know, that the possibility is there. And we acknowledge these things, but the reality of how most people are treated today is that they go and see doctors and they have very short visits. The doctors don't really get to know them very well. No. Sometimes they only diagnose them with scales that people fill out in the waiting room. And then they get put on medications and told to come back. And usually yeah. they're given a biological explanation for what's going on. Hey, you know, we don't really know why depression happens, but maybe it has something to do with some underlying chemical imbalance and, you know, the drug's safe and effective. And the reason that people get told that about the psychiatric conditions is, is pretty much, you know, the way I see it is it's, it's expedient for healthcare. It allows people to be treated in short 15 minute visits where people don't really have to get to know them that well, because that's not scalable. Right. It's expedient. Well, it's, it's good for a drug company for people to see depression and these problems as biological because they can prescribe medications for it. And it kind of supports right. their, their way of helping people. And gosh, the, the big, the big, um, you know, tin hat conspiracy thing that I'm going to say now is I, I also think it's, it's, it's helpful politically as well. Because I do think a lot of the reasons why people are unhappy come from very valid problems that are happening in the world. And if you just oh, yeah. say, oh, my God, depression is on the rise, you know, the, this this thing, and it's probably biological, you don't have to talk about, I don't know, inequality and the problems with poverty and the tax structure and how, like... It's uh, inflation and all of these problems that really actually trickle down to normal people and make them right. unhappy. You just sweep it under the rug and just say, oh, you might have a chemical imbalance and don't worry, we got, we got something for that. So right. I think there's a lot of reasons that push us to look at mental illness as biologically and fixed with the pill. And it's not helpful for people. It actually makes them sicker in the long run, yeah. a lot of them. Yeah, no, and I see that all the time. So, I mean, my demographic that comes into my office, you know, um, are mainly women. And gosh, you know, these meds have been around for what, since the late 80s, early 90s. And mm -hmm. some of them have been on since the 90s, uh, 2000s, you know, so they've been on these medications for a couple of decades. And now, I mean, they feel rotten, right? They feel like it's it's just, everything's just gotten worse. Their hormones are worse, this, but this and that, and nobody's checking anything else. They're just leaving them on the medication, you know, and then we check, you know, their thyroid or their hormone imbalances. And the, there's an underlying cause that's not related to anxiety, depression. I mean, those imbalances are, are triggering probably some of that. And when we fix them and they're off the meds, they feel fantastic. Um, but nobody ever checked those things for them to start with. I mean, it's not just a set of arbitrary symptoms that don't mean anything. And then we just give them, I feel like an arbitrary diagnosis. And so I give a lot of women, my point is I have a lot of women that come into the, into my office. They're like, I just don't feel like I've been heard. Like I still have the same issues I had. And mm -hmm. um, I, my life kind of sucks right now. And, you know, it's been 20 years and I really want something different. And it's just, it's, it makes me really, really sad um, that people have to live this way when the, the, there's definitely a better way. Yeah, and and you and you raise a good point that that we we actually have I think deteriorated in in the quality of care that we give to people coming in and reporting depressive symptoms because a lot of the times depressive symptoms 
aren't stemming from some underlying unknown biological problem or even life stresses. I mean, it can be things like yeah. autoimmune problems. It can be diet. Um, I the Because I now work in a clinic where we just take people off meds, I mean, I see people all the time who are like, I was on medications for two decades and I had ECT and then I did a ketogenic anti-inflammatory diet and I felt better and now I want to come off my meds because right. I don't need them and my mood is under control. And we, we just, we, we, and, and it's not always diet. I just bring diet up as an example, because it's something that's diminished in the, in the medical system as not being real medicine a lot of the times. Right. So I bring that up as it's overlooked, but we see people with sleep apnea that oh gets gosh, overlooked, yes. autoimmune conditions get overlooked and you treat those things and people go, Oh, I'm not depressed. Well, you never had depression in the first place. You had a medical problem. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and, and because you just saw someone for, you know, 15 minutes and they were looking at your cholesterol and your blood pressure and filling out something for your insurance company. No, no one ever took the time to really work you up and understand um, what was going on. Yeah. And sometimes it's, do people get depressed and anxious? Yes, they do. And like you were talking earlier, I mean, we just shut the country down for two years. That's going to make people, you know, sad, depressed, anxious, those kind of things. And so a medication doesn't fix that. Um, you know, we, there's other things that we, ha that we have to deal with. And I would love for you to talk about like the long-term side effects of these medications. Um, it, what, what is it doing to people's bodies, to their mind, to their health in the long run? Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's, I, let's, let's start by talking about what, what the drugs actually do. And I, and I think I, I'd like to talk about depression because it's, it's the one that's most sure. relatable to people, but this holds true for schizophrenia, bipolar, and, and any of the other ones. So um, a lot of people were told incorrectly that these drugs were fixing an underlying problem in their brain. They said, depression's due to low serotonin. This Prozac will increase your serotonin and you'll be better. And it's this idea of the condition being like diabetes, where there's this well understood pathological process that we're intervening in with, a very um you know targeted intervention that's going to correct it and all of the problems that 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 the person is having flowed from that pathology which we've now fixed and you don't even need to think about it it's 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 just like insulin for diabetes you just give it to them and everything's done everything's gonna be good now yeah that that is not how psychiatric drugs work there's no underlying chemical imbalance and so the best way to understand what they do is that they have drug effects, just like alcohol or nicotine, um, okay. and but they're more stable, right? And because these mm -hmm. are longer acting drugs, they stay in your system and they mo and they modify your mood. Um, these effects can vary in people, uh, but if we were talking about SSRIs, uh, which are really common, like Prozac and Lexapro, they tend to be mostly mood mostly numbing and a little bit stimulating as well. That's the effect. And so uh, that, and that could be very therapeutic. If someone is having a high level of anxiety and you just turn the volume down on that, they can actually experience that as very helpful and therapeutic right. and they can improve in their function. Another drug that people take is Wellbutrin. That's an antidepressant that people find as being more stimulating and motivating and gives you more get up and go. So all of these drugs, they have a signature drug effect Right. Um, and that's that's what happens. So now now we we talk about long term effects. Well, one of the one of the let's let's say this one one of the problems with psychiatric drugs is your body and your brain they don't like them. So these neurotransmitter systems like serotonin and such they they're, they're not just these tiny chemicals that change our mood and our anxiety. I mean they're involved in how our heart beats and how we digest yeah. food and even our immune system. And so when you start taking drugs that throws off those systems, and that's what the drugs do, they modulate neurotransmitter systems, um, you've disrupted numerous physiological processes in your body. And your body doesn't like that, so it sends signals up to the brain to say, hey, we need you to uh, change the structure of your neurons to adapt to this to keep us back in balance. And so over time, multiple things can happen, and I've seen all of these we have some people who never fully adapt to the drug and they just get that nice therapeutic drug effect for a long time. And that's just great for them. I have a lot of people who adapt to them and the drug just doesn't do anything after a period of time. They go, I have no idea what this thing is doing anymore. Maybe I'm having some side effects, but I don't yeah. really know. And then for some people, it just starts making them worse. They develop a condition called tardive dysphoria where they just feel flat and apathetic 
and they're just like, oh, I don't really know what this is. It's it just it just feels like a different kind of depression, and uh, and they've genuinely been made worse by the drug, and often that's misdiagnosed, and they, and they get and they get on more things. And so the, right. the right. when it comes to long term psychiatric drug use, <laughs> the one thing that I like to tell people is like you don't know what's going to happen long term because we don't know how your brain is is going to do on this drug after a long period of time. So. Right. That's the one risk that, that it could stop working or it could make you worse in the long run. But the other thing that I think is it's hard to even call it a side effect because it is the drug's effect. Let, let's say, for instance, you're taking Prozac and there's something about it that's emotionally constricting. Um, that's just not helping you in in one area, in, in one defined area. That, that's having global effects for you. And so maybe being emotionally attuned was helpful in your relationships. Um, maybe it made you more um, observant of what's happening with your children or with your spouse. And, and and now that's been turned down some, and that's having a detrimental effect. It's, how you, it's having some collateral damage. Yes, it helped you in one area, but it's also taken away from you in, an, in another. And so you want to be mindful about how the drug is affecting you globally. Um and then, I mean, there's a whole range of other things, but I'll talk about the the most important side effects. I mean, with antidepressants, there's weight gain as well. That that yeah. tends to be an issue. Um, and this is not just it make it doesn't just make people crave food. You can't like think yourself out of the weight gain. I mean, these drugs change your your basal metabolic rate, so you just accumulate um, more weight. And um, and and so they do a, they do a number of things there. But, the, but there's a couple of rare ones, which we really worry about. There's this PSSD. This is uncommon. This is likely to not happen to anyone listening, but this, this is something that I see a lot. Some people develop persistent sexual dysfunction, even when they come off the drug. Um, and that is clearly devastating. That's now recognized by most major health authorities. It's written about in the drug labels. And the other thing that we really worry about with the drugs is something called protracted withdrawal. And this is a neurological injury that happens when people come off the drugs too quickly. It doesn't happen to, to everyone. In fact, it's quite an uncommon thing to happen. But in a small group of people that come off the medications too quickly, they start to develop neuropathy, like uh, burning in their hands and feet, ear ringing, yeah. and then this persistent anxiety. And that can be that can be really bad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so when those things are happening to people, like what's the next steps for them to do? So like with this protractive, um, you know, disorder, what do you do with that? Uh, so the good thing about protracted withdrawal is it just gets better over time. Uh, okay. You could consider it to be like a, like a nervous system bruise. There was something about coming off the drug too quickly that shocked your system. Yeah. And so time, you just, you, you wait it out. And, and in the vast majority of people, it goes away completely or near complete, completely, but it does, it can take a couple of years and it's really can be quite disabling. And then a lot of people, once that happens, they want to get off the drugs, but you have to do it safely. And so you have to do these gradual tapers so you can bring the drug out of your system without irritating your nervous system again. Right. When I, and I was watching your videos, you do what sounds very unique because I've never heard anybody else do this, you know, as you're tapering, um, you actually will even help people to taper with, with drops, like you liquefy the medication and, and do all sorts of amazing things that I have honestly never, never had a doc do with any of my clients over the years. So can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, so, so we, we sometimes use liquid formulations to taper people because as you get to the lower doses of the drug, they tend to be the, it, it tends to be really hard to get off uh, without triggering withdrawal. There's, there's, there's something about the way uh, psychiatric drugs in particular bind to receptors where when you're on very high doses, it's really easy to make large, to, to make reductions. But when you get to low doses, it's like the drug is less sticky. And so if you're at a low dose and you remove a, a little bit, it can trigger uh, qu quite a severe withdrawal, even though it feels like you're only taking away a little. It just, it, it has a big change at the receptor. Yeah. And so to get around that, um, and, and so what people do sometimes is they, they try to taper with tablets and they'll get like a pill splitter and you can only yeah. really accurately split a pill into a quarter before it, it gets a little bit fiddly. 
Um, but some people will find that even when they drop a quarter of the tablet, especially at the low dose, it, it causes a flare up of withdrawal symptoms and then they kind of get stuck there. Yeah. So what we do is we get the drug and we turn it into a uh, liquid and then, you know, we use a set concentration and then we start to use syringes and there's a lot of precision when you use syringes because there's all these little markings on the side. Yeah. And then that allows us to lower the drug, um, uh, quite precisely, especially at those lower ranges. And that just helps people kind of bust through plateaus and maybe they stalled out at a low dose, but once they're doing smaller reductions, uh, their body can compensate for the drug being removed. And, and so we call that uh, liquid, liquid tapering. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. How do you determine how fast a person can taper? I, I'm assuming it depends on the drug for one or how long the person has been on the drug. Yeah. So the, the, the way I do it is it's to prevent, uh, uh, with, well, the main thing is to prevent protracted withdrawal, right. but the other thing is to keep people functioning. And so I, I would say when you taper someone, you want them to be having mild withdrawal symptoms because the mild withdrawal symptoms, the tolerable ones there, they are what is triggering the brain to regrow all the receptors that have kind of downregulated. That was another question I had. How do we know that things are regrowing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you, we we want people to have mild withdrawal symptoms because that's going to trigger that that regrowth, but it's also going to allow them to maintain their level of functioning. And so, what I have people do in my practice is they complete a diary. So after they do a reduction, we'll track their symptoms and we make sure that they're only having mild withdrawal symptoms, and then. Um, and then we just keep on going. And if anything ever gets, if it starts ticking up, it starts to Im impair their, impact their life. We say, okay, we're going too quickly. And then we cut the rate down. Mm. Um, and so each rate is completely determined by the person doing the taper. Okay. That makes sense. What's the most yeah. difficult class of drugs to come off of? Um, SSRIs. So like your Prozac, Lexapro and such the SNRIs as well. So that's like Venlafaxine, um, and, um, you know, Prestique, um, and then, uh, benzodiazepines yeah. the, those, so I'd say antidepressants and benzodiazepines are hard. It's not to say that antipsychotics and mood stabilizers are, are challenging as well, but they just don't seem from my experience, they just don't seem to be as challenging as SSRIs and benzos. Yeah, those are those can be super challenging, especially it depends on the one like Prozac. Um, do you ever do like that Prozac bridge? Um, I've had people use that, like if they're going off, say, of a Fexor, they'll put them on Prozac and then they taper from the Prozac there. <clears throat> um, I, I've seen a lot of people do that. In, in my practice, we we generally try and taper people on the drug that their brain currently is on? used okay. to. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's definitely a strategy that we've seen people use and, and it can be a useful one and an effective one sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I've seen it be effective, yeah. not all the time, but I just curious yeah. if that's something you use. Yeah. Or not. yeah. Um, so when people are coming off of their meds, their brain is healing. Um, do you find that people have sort of a level of fear in coming off their medications or are the people that you're, you're working with, they're like, yes, we're ready. Um, Cause I know it's kind of like the unknown. What's it going to be like? Cause if you've been on that med for 20 years, what's life going to be like off the medication? And so how do you kind of help people through maybe some of that thought process? -y? It, well, it really, a lot of it really depends about why they were on the meds in the first place. I mean, we may have some people who, Hey, you know, 10 years ago, I moved town and the doctor just, I was depressed and the doctor put me on the meds, but now I've got a great life. I'm doing well. And I have just been refilling it, but I don't really think I'm depressed and, and they're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. That person's usually not that scared about coming off. They feel well supported that they, they're not really sure why they needed it in the first place. And you just go slowly and, yeah. and they come off, but we help some people who had very legitimate psych, um, symptoms, you know, they, they, they had trauma histories. They were on the medications right. for legitimate reasons. And for whatever reason now, they, they can't be on the medication or they've just decided it's not worth it. And that can be a little daunting because now, now you're taking off the medication, but you're also trying to help the person 
um, cope with non drug non drug means right. and and really you cannot predict what's going to happen. I mean, some people like they've just through maturity and the passage of time and the supports that they have, they're able to cope without the meds. Um, but some people need a lot of support and you, and you just have to be with them as you slowly wean them off and just see where things lay. Um, I mean, in, in our program, we like to have people do anti-inflammatory ketogenic diets, and we just try and bolster them up and make them as healthy mentally as possible with non-drug yeah. means while they calm down. Um, but it is unpredictable. And we do have some people who are, who are nervous about coming off and we just tell them we're in the trenches with them and whatever happens, we'll figure it out with them as they go right. down. Yeah. Yeah, clearly yeah. they're coming to you because they want to. So they're, they're ready, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what you have to be. So not like you're forcing people off of medication. So mm -hmm. you work a lot with a ketogenic diet as your diet, as you're tapering people. So it's something that we suggest to people just because we've okay. seen uh, a lot of people have sometimes dramatic improvements with Very. it. But mm -hmm. but we've also tapered people who chain smoke and eat McDonald's all day, yeah. and it still and that still works as well. It it for, like for some people it will be the thing that makes a huge difference, but for others it'll just generally make them feel more healthy. And um, but I, I recommend that everyone try it, especially if it's unclear where their symptoms are coming from. Like it doesn't really make sense that it's anchored in contextual stresses in their life or something else. It's like, Hey, maybe it's your diet. Um, and right. it's, it's, it's definitely worth looking into. Right. So have you discovered like any specific consistent root causes for people? Like, do you see a pattern? Like if somebody, you know, is on an SSRI, you know, do they have a specific level of toxicity or do they have like women? Do you see that maybe they all have hormone issues? Do you see a pattern of any kind? Um, let me see. I, so I work with a lot of people who are on sedatives. So I, I, I have people <laughs> who have like work stress and gotcha. anxieties. I uh -huh. also have a lot of just, um, I mean, and then I have some really sad cases. I mean, I have people who lose children and then in yeah. the aftermath of losing kids, they, you know, they, they got on meds and then the meds turned on them. Um, I, oh. you know, I, I, this is awful, but I have a lot of women at the moment who were put on sedatives for perimenopausal insomnia and yeah. then that kind of turned on them. Um, yeah. and, um, that's really unfortunate because, you know, there's other hormonal ways that they, they, they could have tr treated that. They could have gone a different route instead of putting them on Xanax. Um, right. And I would and love so, to know your thoughts. Why do you think that happens? Because, you know, I have a lot of women that come to me in similar situation and they're like, they really didn't feel like they were being heard. They're like, here, just take this med because you're just kind of crazy at this point in time in your life. And it's normal to feel this way. Because it's expedient is is why I think it's it's done. Um, you know, people come into the office and they go, "Oh man, you know, I'm having insomnia. What should I do?" And and it takes time to to say, "Well, let, let me just really understand what's going on. This is really normal. This is scary." Or maybe even just to do the referral um, to, "Hey, go go and see a hormonal uh, hormonal uh, right. OBGYN, someone that might understand that." better and here's this referral it's it's very easy just to say oh well you know just just you could take this 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 will help and you know see you later you, you get them out the door in in the 15 minutes uh, it, it's just faster yeah yeah i know it's just expedient healthcare isn't always efficient so or it seems efficient but it's not efficient for the patient so well, you know, one of the things that it's so interesting, like the incentives, because I, I look at um, Medicare reimbursement for psychiatrists and um, you, so you, there's different codes for like a 15 minute visit versus like a 25 minute visit versus like yeah. a, a visit with psychotherapy and 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 you almost make double like, so if you were to spend an hour as a psychiatrist now, meeting with someone and doing psychotherapy as opposed to seeing four people and doing um 
the you know med management visits you'd make half as much and so there are incentives baked into insurance reimbursement that that make doctors and healthcare systems want to see more people in less time um and so there's also that that going on that right that that leads to it yeah yeah i know money it, you have to follow the trail of money right <laughs> yep yeah. yeah 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 unfortunately if there was you know like three things that you would want my listeners to know um what would they be yeah so the first one is if um you go slowly when you go off medications don't ever taper faster than 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 you can handle um that will you know you you want to be functional while you're tapering don't just rip it off and then kind of just grit and bear it that that's a bad thing to do um it it, it really shocks your brain um Go and go and go and see someone who spends time with you. Gosh, you know, if you, if you're having a lot of anxiety and d depression, and you feel like no one ever took the time to hear your life story and and look at other other non drug ways of helping you, I mean, you may have some psychological things that 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 you could look at, and that could you that could be really helpful for you in the long run. You may have medical problems that people have simply missed. Mm -hmm. um don't 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 settle for uh someone seeing you in 15 minutes and just saying hey you know let's kind of bump the dose that that's not good health care and so find someone who spends time with you and gosh i can't think of i can't think of number three right now you may have that's all right. back to me on that one that's fine so if, yeah. what's one of your favorite stories you know of a patient that you've had that you've helped or two of them what, what do you, what's your favorite um let me see well i mean i i mean this isn't representative but this this does happen sometimes i mean we we've had yeah, we have we've had people who have been on meds for like fifteen years and suicidal in and out of hospital, and they changed their diet. Um, not with us before they came to us; they did it on their own, and then they're just they they tell us I I don't need to be on these meds anymore, and then they're on multiple antidepressants and antipsychotics. So we've seen that multiple times, which is just mind blowing. Um, uh, yeah. because you think about the trajectory of someone's life. And how how different it would be, you know, uh, chronically mentally ill in and out of hospital to just healthy, not needing meds, their mind is working again, and they're ready to go. Those those stories are miraculous. But the other really satisfying ones, and this is really niche, um, just to, like I work with people who have been cognitively destroyed by the drugs, and so they're quite hurt. And that's quite a grind. I mean, you just work with them and their families over uh, sometimes years while they slowly recover and they, and, they, and they all do. And that's really rewarding just to have people kind of come back together, regain their health and move on with their lives. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing. You're mm -hmm. doing such an amazing work. Um, we, need, we need more of you around the country. So hopefully you are training other psychiatrists to do the same things that you're doing, Yosef. We are we we are training people at the moment, which is which is great. We're, we're we're expanding and we're training people, and and I love it. Good. So if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, I want I want to do this work, you know, make sure you contact <laughs> Dr. Yosef here because this is this is so good. So uh, this has been a great conversation. I I admire your work, I respect your work, and I appreciate all that you're doing for the world. And um, any parting words you want to leave the audience with? No, thank just just thank you for having me, and I I, I love talking about this. If you want to find me, I'm uh, 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 Doctor Joseph on YouTube, but it's spelt in the German way, so it's uh, J O S E F, um, and I go by either Doctor Joseph or Taper Clinic. We're on all social media platforms, so uh, if you want to learn more about me, that's where you can find me. Perfect. All that will be in the show notes too for people to to click on. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for being on today. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me.
All right. And everybody else, thank you for listening. Make sure you share this podcast because I know you know someone that needs this information. So make sure you like, subscribe, and share. And I will see you in the next episode.